Hello everyone and welcome to Handmade Hero, the show where we code a complete game live on Twitch. No engines, no libraries, it's just us coding here, uh, doing everything by hand, and we are in the middle of optimizing some code, so I want to kind of get back to that. Uh, if you want to follow along at home, today is day 120. Um, so if you would like to uh, follow from where I am today, you can open up a day 117, uh, sorry, day 119 zip file, and that is the source code that I am starting with uh, today. So we had um, sort of two more things optimization-wise that I wanted to talk about. Uh, where we did a you know sort of rudimentary optimization work on this routine, and we got it down to 48 cycles. Um, and I tried to make a little thing that would count cycles, and it, it's fine, you know, I mean, we, we did a thing that counts, uh, sorry, not, not cycles, that counts instructions, and we did a little thing that does exactly uh, that, so you can actually um, see, uh, <clears throat> let's see here, mm, you can see how we kind of did that, we made a, a little thing which uh, goes through and pound defines all of the intrinsics that we were using uh, to sort of count how many of them there were. Uh, but but this um, this got Fabian this bothered Fabian at like a deep emotional level, uh, and not because of that he was fine with that. Uh, but he did not like the way that we were attributing our counts here, and the reason he did not like them uh, was because he felt like it was just not a useful number by putting the throughput directly uh, in here. Right? He didn't think that was a good idea. And the reason he didn't think that was a good idea is because, well, the throughput number already includes the parallelism of the CPU, right? Uh, so basically, the throughput number, if it says, like this one right here that says one third, if it says one third, what that means is that the processor could do three of those in a cycle effectively. If, if everything was going properly and it was pipelined properly and whatever else has to happen, it's going to be able to do uh, three of those in a cycle, right? So it's counting in that uh, the way that it's actually doing that is because it has multiple units that can do an AND. So what it can do is when it sees an AND, it could issue up to three of them at the same time. Hence, you get uh, only a third of a cycle to do any given one of them, because you can do three of them in effectively one cycle or a third of a cycle uh, per AND, right? But uh, for something like an add or a multiply, right, and you look at it and it says one cycle, that's the throughput for that because there's only one unit that can do an add or a multiply. We actually went and verified that. But an add and a multiply could be issued together. And we talked about this a little bit at the end of last stream, the fact that you could overlap adds and multiplies, which is why I said things were running so much faster than the total uh, cycle count, even with the throughput factored in there. You know, it was a situation where it was clear that like adds and multiplies were happening at the same time and so on. And so what Fabian objected to was it's kind of a meaningless number to add it up this way because we are capturing the fact that the and can be issued three times in one cycle, but we're not capturing the fact that the add and the multiply can be issued in, in the same cycle. So really like either he's arguing, and it's a perfectly reasonable argument, you should change like the add and the multiply to be like half a cycle or something. I mean, you should, you should try to like incorporate that cross thing parallelism, but you know, that's gonna be inaccurate for obvious reasons. Or you should knock out the and and say like, okay, you know, just try to count the total number of instructions. Like either do a proper overestimate or a proper underestimate, but like mixing them, it really bothered him. So I was like, well, we'll see what we can do. And I said to him, but you know, I mean, the only way to do this right is the way I did it on the 360, which is I wrote a little program that tries to simulate the CPU, and what it would do is it would take all the assembly that you had, and it, the actual assembly, not the intrinsics, and it would actually go and it would figure out exactly what the chip would do to the degree to which it was documented, and that would tell you when there were stalls, like because something couldn't get issued in the same cycle as something else or all these other things. You could see, here's how many cycles this thing should take best case, right? And Fabian was like, well, yeah, they, you can do that. Intel actually ships a tool for you to do that if you want. He said it's, uh, it's the Intel Architecture Code Analyzer. And I'm like, what? Um, so he pointed me to this, and I feel like we should at least try it out, because this would be some way I could show on the stream exactly what's happening in the processor. Oh, well, not exactly, but to the degree that Intel knows. And right, like Intel 
you know, they're the ones who know how it was made. And so presumably, and I don't know if maybe they sandbag a little bit to try and prevent some kind of reverse engineering or something, but presumably that would mean that all of the things that we don't know about what will happen with the processor, they have actually captured in here somewhere. Um, so I don't know, I've never used this tool before, but Fabian said you could just use it and it would show you that information. So let's see, I'll run it on our code and we can see if we can get a dump of that. Uh, so here's the Windows 64-bit version. This is supposedly a free piece of software. Um, do not know what this license agreement says. Uh, does it say anything about not using this on Handmade Hero Stream? Uh, let's see. We are not trying to reverse engineer it. Uh, we are not trying to distribute it. We are not expecting them to be liable for when this blows up the machine. Um, so I think we're okay here. I think this is okay. Uh, so let's take a look. So there is our Win64. Um, and like I said, I've never used this before, so you'll have to bear with me. I don't really know anything about this tool. Uh, much like Visual Studio 2013, which we tried on the stream for the first time, this is the development tool I have no experience with. So. Uh, I make no promises, but we'll go ahead uh, and we'll open up, uh, where is this, W? We'll open up W and we'll dump it in here. And if it works, uh, it works. So there we go. All right. Uh, so I don't know why, did that, why did that default to, to like compressed or encrypted? I don't know why that, all right. Well, we don't really need to encrypt it. Um, that's weird. All right, uh, how do I decrypt that? Oh, I guess I've got to go through it this way because it can't handle the fact the drive is substed. I don't even want to know what that just was, people. And of course, now Windows is thinking about it. So it may be in classic Windows fashion that the hardest part about actually using this tool will be getting Windows to stop thinking about letting me use the tool, uh, which apparently is, is like this really long involved process. I can't actually imagine why that is, um, but apparently that is. Okay, can you please, what is the problem? This is absurd. So is there something I don't understand here about what's going on? Well, I can use it while we're waiting for that to happen, I suppose, I don't know what's going on, I can look at it after. Uh, so anyway, what Fabian said is that basically what you're supposed to do uh, is you're supposed to include this H file temporarily, right? You don't, this is not actually something you, you don't build with this normally, but when you want it to give you, uh, when you want it to run it through this little code analysis tool, uh, what you do is you include this IACA marks.h file, uh, which we'll go ahead and include in here, right? So uh, let's go ahead and do that. You can include uh, IACA marks.h, like so. Um, and then you can use that to mark the section that you want it to give you a uh, sort of an analysis of, if that makes sense. Uh, so you can see it here, and uh, basically all this is is just, it's, it's literally just the markers uh, that you're supposed to use, right? Uh, and so all I think it really does is emit code that, that then their anal analyzing tool can use to look at your binary and see what's in it, right? So what we want to do is say, all right, let's do a start and an end around this block that we were trying to analyze before, right? So like right here, we could just do uh, a start and then let it, you know, let it count all that stuff. And then we can go down and at the end of it, um, just do, do the end, right? So, uh, oops, is that, that's actually here, I guess, right? Is that correct? Uh, start, yeah, and end. Okay, there we go. So that uh, should be that, I think. Uh, so we're gonna have to modify the build briefly just to include that directory, right? Because it's not gonna know uh, where that actually is. So I need to have some way of telling it to how to find that. So when we actually compile our stuff, I'll just throw in an include directory here, right? I'll go back. Uh, one, two directories uh, to this uh, IACA win64 uh, slash, uh, well, no slash, just, I think that's just, just it, right? So let's compile that and see, uh, did, is that not correct? Backslash, backslash, IA64, um, 
that should be it, right? Oh, no, we're in the build directory. Never mind. So we're, we're building into w build. So it's really just one backslash to get back to the root. And that should be it, right? ICA marks.h. Uh, I feel like that should have worked. Although, you know what I should do now that I noticed it as well for people on other platforms? It's got a capital letter in the name there. Uh, so for people who are building on Linux, uh, that would cause them no end to the consternation. So let's, let's go ahead and put that in there. So why is this giving me grief? If I do a W colon, um, would it work? No, it still can't find IACA marks.h, but I don't, oh, pfft. <laughs> how about I don't edit the removed 32-bit version? That's, that's good. Nicely done, Casey. Yeah, that could be it. All right, uh, let's see here. Um, well, that is a problem because it looks like that's not gonna work on this. Do we need to do, ah, VC64. Is this what we need to do here? Um, trying to figure out which one we would use. Maybe we need to use this one since uh, it's the 64-bit debugger can't do asm emits, uh, which kind of makes me wonder, what are they doing? I don't, what's write gs byte? That's pretty interesting. I don't even know what that is. That's some voodoo right there. Oh, that's pretty cool. All right, so now in theory, uh, we are supposed to be able to, let me make sure that we're building in O2, we are. So now in theory, what you're supposed to be able to do is run this little IACA thing, right? And you can tell it it's a 64-bit thing. You can say that it's a, a, got an architecture and NHM is the Nehalem thing that we've got, right? Uh, and now we're supposed to be able, I guess, to just give it uh, our build. And it's supposed to know, like it's supposed to be able to tell us what the actual cycle counts are. And lo and behold, that's exactly what it did. Check it out, people. Look at this. All right, so this is pretty great. Let's go through this and see if we can understand it. I've never seen one of these before, but uh, pretty great. All right, so port binding in cycles per iteration. <clears throat> uh, so here's all we've got. I, I don't actually know what this readout is supposed to tell us, though, because looking at it here, that... Well, actually, I guess that could sort of be. Well, let's, let's, just, let's just move through it. But anyway, uh, so here's what it's, is, this chart is going to tell us here. I'm, I'm going to hold off on this for a second because I don't necessarily know exactly what that's trying to tell me in terms of like DV and D and so on here. So I'm not sure. Uh, oh, divider pipe. Uh, and But D, I don't know. D is data fetch pipe. Okay. Um, so we're just going to take a look here uh, and, and see what's going on, right? So we've got a move. And so I guess what it's telling us is right, is this structure, this is one micro-op, right, which is the thing that the processor fundamentally operates on. Remember when I said things can have micro-ops, so basically a single instruction might take multiple micro-ops because it might be that that instruction itself is actually sort of broken into multiple instructions inside the processor, basically. So the things we see are not exactly what the processor executes all the time. Sometimes they are, and when something is one micro-op, then it sort of is, right? It's like one, it's one to one, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so that went into port one, uh, this went into the, these two moles, both went into this port. Now, something that I don't actually know what this is trying to say here, right, is I don't know if that implies that since these went into either port that they would be, uh, that they wouldn't conflict. Like since this is in port five and this is in port zero, presumably uh, they could issue at the same time. But I don't see, again, since I've never used this tool before, uh, I've never, I, I don't actually know what the, you know, what is actually, what it's actually trying to tell me uh, as far as simultaneous execution is. So CP, like I wonder if the CP, what is CP? Is CP like one clock tick or something potentially? Because that would make some sense, right? Like if you look at this, um, I don't know if CP means like maybe that's when it had to click over. And that would make some sense, right? Because uh, well, of course, you've got two multiplies in here, so I don't know. So I'm not sure. Uh, 
so this may take actually some actually you know some study to try and figure out what all the stuff is I mean I'm sure there's a manual that comes with it and I don't know that we need to do that right now but this is kind of cool because I did not know that they had actually shipped a tool that you were allowed to use externally that did this sort of stuff that's really great that's what we would have had to build ourselves when I kind of alluded to if we wanted to do something that really looked at the ports this will basically tell us on the Nehalem exactly what that those sort of port issues actually are right and so this is much better than the little janky macros that I was using, and this would be a great thing for us to use. So I, again, wish I CP was listed as what that was uh, going to do. A lot of these other things here, it actually says, like microfusion happened, uh, which I assume is sort of saying that micro ops could be done together in some way. I'm not sure, um, but you can see that this happened a couple times in here, right? Um, but a lot of those other ones, 0F, what else have we got in here? Uh, macro fusion with the previous instruction occurred. So what was that? Uh, let's see here. JS test, okay, so basically we're saying it could do these together uh, so it didn't actually have to count. I guess the jump, a test is something that sets the condition bit and the jump jumps on that. So this is like, you know, a conditional being executed here, right? And so I guess it, it was able to fuse those operations together so that they didn't take a cycle each or anything like this, right? So some of that, uh, what else have we got here? Anything else interesting? Um, looks like mostly just the caret and the F. I don't see anything else. So yeah, this is pretty great. I mean, this is also great because it tells us exactly what instructions were being executed. You can look at the assembly pretty easily in this format and see what's going on, which is pretty great. Um, so yeah, this is, this is pretty awesome. I'm glad he sent this to us. I also don't know, it looks like there's some other kind of fun things too. Like, uh, I don't know, there's just, there's just some fun stuff in here. Like you can output a graph, I guess, uh, if you install graph viz, I don't know, that's kind of cool, right? Um, uh, so there's, just I don't know, it's just pretty cool. So what this tells us, if this is correct, it says that this block of code should take 86 cycles uh, to execute, right? And what's kind of interesting about that is that that is actually lower than what we were observing, right? Because um, if you think about it, we were calculating uh, four pixels at a time, right? Uh, so 86 divided by 4 is like 21, 22 cycles per pixel. And so we are clearly half the speed we would be if this were just executing straight through, right? Based on what this tool is saying. It says the block throughput is 86 cycles. So I don't know. Um... That would suggest that we might be waiting on some memory. That would suggest that maybe we can do some interesting things uh, in terms of maybe doing some prefetching. I don't know, right? So I'm not sure. It seems like maybe there's some room uh, for improvement there. It's something to think about. So I don't know that we necessarily want to go into that right now, but I really wanted to kind of see if that worked and it kind of looks like it does. So that's pretty awesome. That means we can get rid of all this cruft uh, and just have a nice way of actually using a tool. Like I said, it would be nice if the compiler did this for you. Well, this is the next best thing, right? It's not built into the compiler, so it's a little inconvenient. You gotta do uh, some kind of little janky, a few janky little steps there. But on the whole, that was pretty unoffensive, right? That was not very difficult to do. And uh, so I'll take that any day over having to write, you know, um, sort of like uh, a simulator that I run myself for a processor where I don't actually have necessarily all the documentation about how it's supposed to work, right? Uh, if I trust Intel is actually doing a reasonable job on that thing, then presumably it should be authoritative uh, and we can run it through that tool and figure out what they think it actually will take uh, to run. So that's pretty cool. <coughs> uh, all right, so we don't really need to do that at the moment. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get rid of that uh, for a minute, right? Uh, and I can do that pretty trivially. This way we don't need, need that include because most of the time we don't really want to be building with that. It's not, it's not part of the program, right? That's not something that we're really using directly, but we want to kind of be able to uh, per perhaps turn it back on again a little bit in the future. So that's, that's pretty great. Um, again, another big thanks to Fabian uh, for that. 
Uh, he is, like I said, kind of on Twitter. He is uh, our, our sort of our optimization, our patron saint of optimization at the moment. Um, and he mentioned something else uh, that we should take a look at today. Uh, today's kind of maybe a Fabian cleanup day in that sense. He mentioned something else that I think it would be nice to take a look at. He was pointing out uh, as well that we didn't uh, take as much advantage of some math rearrangement as we could. And this kind of gets more into actual optimization optimization, right? Because all we really did, um, you know, you saw me do it, but all I really did, right, when we were working on this routine is I wasn't really optimizing the routine. I was just translating the routine, right? I was translating the routine from scalar to SIMD, and that's mostly what we did. And then I did a little bit yesterday of, like, finding some things that were easy to pull out into things that could be done in the loop, and we saved some cycles that way, um, but that, that was really it, right? But what he was pointing out is, well, first of all, uh, he was saying, you know, bilinear and squaring, right? Uh, they don't actually have to be done in floating point if we didn't want to do them in floating point, right? And furthermore, they don't have to be done zero to one if we don't want to do them zero to one. So what he pointed out is we're doing all these multiplies, right? Mul PS to do the in, in 255 uh, 4x, right? We're, these are these are in 0 to 255 space and we're turning them to 0 1 space. He was saying, you know, at, you know, very simply, you could just start with doing that after you did the bilinear, right? Because you could square numbers just fine in 0 to 255 space and you can bilinear things just fine in 0 to 1 space. So uh, I'm sorry, in 0 to 255 space. So why are you multiplying all these values when if you just moved that after the fact, right, you would only have to do the multiply on the result. So let's take a look at that, right? If we got rid of all of these multiplies, we're just doing the simplest first step. If I just got rid of all of these multiplies, so basically everything here was doing that mul ps. Uh, we got rid of. So I'm just, you know, I'm just killing it. Right, um, kill rectangle. Uh, I'm just getting rid of it there. So basically all of these things that we're doing a multiply, we just get rid of all those multiplies. And we were doing a lot of multiplies and multiplies we only have one unit. We learned that yesterday at the end of the stream. We only have one unit. So those multiplies don't overlap with each other. You can only get one per cycle at maximum, right? That was the throughput uh, on those, I think. And there's only one unit, so they don't dual issue. Uh, so, you know, if you get too many multiplies, you could clog things up. Uh, so we get rid of those multiplies and we just have the square. So basically what it does is it squares the value in the 0 to 5 range. So what that's going to mean is that the maximum value, um, and sorry, I guess I can get rid of this as well, uh, which is basically to say that texel A, texel B A, texel C A, and so on, just don't even get processed at all right there. Uh, what that means is after we do the bilinear, right, <clears throat> Um, after we do the bilinear, now we could do the conversion, right? So now when we do the multiplication uh, by, uh, when we do the multiplication, we can do that. And I guess I just spotted this. We could do it by pre-multiplying that term into the color term, right? Because we're already doing a multiplication here, right? We're already multiplying this by the color, which is a constant. So what if we just took that divisor and baked it right into the color. Then we wouldn't have to add a new multiply at all. We just use the same multiply that we were already doing, right? So let's just do that, right? In color, I think that's the only place it's ever used, right? We've got color R4X here, right? That's the only place that's ever used. So instead, let's go ahead and do an MM set one PS of, of the inv, um, you know, of, of like, I guess our, our normalized coefficient, we'll just call that, right? of our normalized coefficient, we'll bake that in there. And what's that normalized coefficient going to be, right? Well, before it was 1 over 255, right? It was this. But if you think about it, that's not really uh, correct for everybody. It's going to be correct for alpha because they was were 0 to 255. But the rest of these guys got squared, right? So it really means that the, the normalized, if they were going from 0 to 255, if they got squared, they're now going from 0 to 255 squared, right? So their range expanded. The range doesn't expand when you're 0 to 1 and you square it, you stay 0 to 1. That's the magical property of 0 to 1, right? Um, but 
if you actually have a, a value above one, if you're zero to 55, when you square it, your total value goes up, so you widen that range. So what we actually need to do here, right, is have a normalized squared C as well, right, which is just 255 squared, right? Um, and so that uh, is what we would multiply these guys by, right, to normalize them out. So I believe that if we just do that, um, I think that should work, uh, but famous last words, right? And hey, guess what? It does, right? Pretty spiffy. So we got rid of a bunch of work we could do there. Um, unfortunately, we didn't save too many cycles. We're down to 45 cycles uh, roughly now. Um, but the other thing that's important to remember at this point, we also don't really know whether we're starting to be memory bound here, right? So it's hard to say this or that change saved this many cycles or who knows what's happening, right? So we don't really know necessarily all of that stuff. We, we you know, it's hard to say whether some of these things, uh, how much how benefit they actually are, because unless we take uh, memory out of the equation, it's hard to know. Uh, so one thing we could do, right, um, is we could try to, again, like do something where we sort of uh, fudge the sample values, for example, um, to try and take these texture fetches out of the equation, for example, right? Uh, we could do something where <clears throat> we did something like this before. Uh, where we sort of said, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, where we said, okay, you know, what if we were to, uh, what if we were to just stuff those sample values uh, with actual, you know, u and v values or something like this, right? Uh, so we were to say, you know, this is u, um, oh, sorry, this is, uh, let's say, fetch uh, x, 4x, and this is fetch y, 4y, or something like that. You know, we could try to stuff those values. I don't know. It's tough to say. I'm not sure what the best way to analyze that would be, right? Uh, but at the very least, removing all those multiplies certainly can't hurt us. Uh, so I think that was a, a pretty cool thing, right? And it turns out that we actually had this kind of nice, um, this nice sort of, it lined up where we could do that factoring right in there uh, and not have to actually introduce a multiply at the end at all. So that's pretty cool. Uh, the other thing that Fabian was suggesting too, uh, and let me just double check to make sure that that isn't something that also we could do elsewhere, right? I, I don't think so, uh, but I could be wrong about that. Um, so let's see, we are doing, we, after that we do sort of the, well we do the blend, I mean technically, I wanna say, I mean, if you look at this routine, it kind of looks like we don't have to really undo the blend there if we don't want to either, right? We could just keep it all in the zero to 255 space. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but that seems like that could happen, right? Because if we changed this, instead of being zero to one, if we changed to clamp between zero and 65535 or well, 255 squared, 65534, whatever it is, right? If we change to clamping it in the zero to, to the 25 squared space, then we could leave dest in that space as well. And the only thing we'd actually have to normalize would be the alpha value, right? Um, and we wouldn't really even have to normalize that, but we'd, ha it would, we'd have to do an extra normalization later potentially for it, but... So, I mean, even that we might be able to get rid of, but we could leave that for now. So if we got rid of that, then when we came in here and did the blend, right? In theory, we could just use just this one multiply at the end to put things back into the proper range, I think. Does that make sense? I feel like it makes some sense, right? So you would do the square root, you'd actually do the square root not in the zero to one range. Now maybe that's dumb, I don't know, because reciprocal square root might want to be, I don't know. Uh, let's try it. I think it's worth trying, right? We got that far with it. We might as well keep going. That's what I think. Uh, so let's give it a shot. So let's back out this and we'll leave these guys uh, as just whatever the color was, right? Um, 
so let's see here. So if these color values are all in that range, I'm trying to think. I feel like if the color values, if we were to do everything in the 255 range, we'd have to, we're, we're gonna have a little bit, honestly, of a problem um, here, it would seem, with precision. I am a little nervous here about this uh, because if we keep going there, when we multiply by the color, that's gonna introduce, uh, well, it's a multiply, right? So in theory, I guess we could just leave the color in the zero to one space. Should work. I mean, it's a ratio. So I don't know, it should work. I think let's, 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 let's do it. So we multiply by the incoming colors in the zero to one space. So these numbers are all 250, zero to 255, sorry, zero to six, five, five, three, four, or whatever, right? Or it's not 65534, it's, it's 255 squared. I wanna stop saying the wrong thing. It's that, 65025, right? Um, so we go through here, we multiply by the colors. Uh, we would change this to like, uh, you know, zero is still right, but this is max color value or something. So we need, we need to define that, right? Um, and then when we go from sRGB to linear brightness space here, we would just do the squaring like we did before. We wouldn't do the multiply. We'd just leave the dest exactly as it was. And the only person who would get inverted is the alpha for now, which maybe we don't even really have to do that. I'm not sure if that's a savings or not, but you know, we'll leave it that way for now. Then we do the blend as normal. Everybody's in that, that space. And then when we do, when we do this final fix up, uh, instead here, this is just like the renormalized value, right? Uh, re255, I guess we'll call it, or something, uh, which puts stuff back into the 255 space. Um, re255 of fire. <laughs> that is a horrible name for a variable. Uh, so it puts it back into the 0 to 255 space, and then off we go. Does that seem right? uh feel like it is so you know here we just have we'd have max color value uh which is the mm uh again just just it's it's just a replicated value that's that's going to be that that 255 times 255 value right so that we can do the clamping uh and then you know after that we uh just need this guy right uh and that's just going to be after you do that square root um well I mean, actually, it just works, right? Because the square root's gonna bring it back to the zero to 255 range, right? I mean, I feel like we don't even have to do that. I feel like you just do the square root, right? I mean, maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, but if it's already there and you square root that number, then that should be it, right? I mean, that's what we're looking at. So really, it's just the alpha that would need to be uh, fixed up there. And if we, again, didn't actually do that alpha so that we essentially, you know, the way this works is you multiply inv texel A. We only care about inv texel A. So if I just, if I just left the dest A the same, you know, didn't square it. Uh, and, and to be honest, why was the alpha getting square rooted in the first place? Was that a typo that I just introduced? We don't want that. Um, it's not supposed to be squared. It's because the alpha never gets squared, right? Um, right, we should be able to just do it with Texel A here where the only time we actually do it is to do this, this inversion, right? So I feel like as strange as it seems, that's actually correct. I mean, it's kind of crazy, but I think it's right, um, which is wild. Yeah, I mean, I think that's I think that's correct. Uh, so that gets rid of a bunch of operations, actually, um, quite a few, in fact. Uh, so let's take a look at what's going on there. Uh, so it looks like really, 
we're, we're having trouble getting anywhere below the, that boundary, it looks like, right? So I feel like at this point, uh, unless I'm, I'm, you know, doing, so, unless I did something very stupid that I'm not thinking of, uh, it sort of seems like we're running up against, um, we're kind of running up against a bit of a boundary here, right? Uh, I feel like, you know, let's take a look. Um, but if we take a look at what this said before, our block throughput was 86.6 cycles at, at maximum, if you, you know, that's not counting any kind of memory stuff. Uh, so if I go ahead and turn this back on again and do the compile, right? Um, if I ask it what our cycle count is now, uh, what does it have to say? Oops. Eighty-six point two five cycles. Wow. How is that possible? <laughs> so, all of those things we got rid of, the compiler was already getting rid of, or something to that effect. I mean, that's basically the same, right? I mean, that's that's almost exactly the same. Uh, so that's kind of crazy uh, because I feel like that should not be the case. Um, I mean, removing all of those multiplies, they, I guess the compiler was smart enough to get rid of all of those. I don't even know how that would be possible. That seems kind of crazy, uh, but that, that would seem to suggest that that was true, right? Uh, because when we recompiled there, it seems like the analysis uh, is still the same. I probably should diff these two uh, to see what the difference is between them, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely, I feel like there is definitely more mul ps in there, but it's, it's hard to really say. So that's kind of frustrating. I guess I would not have expected that, but I'm not sure it, it does look like that really just has no effect, right? I mean, this is, this is kind of peculiar. I kind of want to go back and look at the difference between those two. Uh, so I don't know if windif is on this machine. That's the thing that comes with uh, let's see, do I have a diff of any kind? Diff, there we go. Um, and maybe beyond com is beyond compare to on here as well? I don't know what's on here. Uh, so win diff, I feel like is used to come with like developer studio. There was a little diffing tool that you could use, uh, but I don't actually know if it's on there. Um, the software development kit, uh, win diff, there it is. So WinDiff is uh, installed in this machine. This, is, this comes with the Microsoft SDKs, or at least it used to. Uh, I assume it still does. It's a little tool for doing diffs, but you could use any, there's lots of public domain tools for diffs. So you could use anything for it. I think what I'd like to do is go ahead and capture these just so I can look at it, because I've never used this tool before, and I kind of want to see, uh, just for my own sort of ed education, right? I kind of want to see uh, what's going on. So I'm going to make dir temp here and I'm going to capture this output. So I'm going to uh, go to temp. Uh, let's see, this is our no moles run dot out, right? Um, oops, capture that. Uh, so we got the, the one with no moles. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy the code uh, so I'll, I'll copy everything in, in this section, right? Uh, like so, but then I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to like back up to where we were, right? Um, so here we go. Just undo backwards, undo backwards, undo backwards, uh, all the way, uh, to the initial run of things. Do, do, do. Okay. So there we go. Okay. 
Okay. Uh, so let's double check it. Now, you know, maybe I did something else stupid. I'm not sure. Um, but here's the, here's the new code we wrote, right? Just so we can keep it in there. Um, and switch back to it uh, later. But here we go. Let's turn this back on. We'll compile it. Uh, and then we'll capture this is the mold run. Right, so that's the one that's doing all those extra multiplications uh, that we didn't really need to do. And so now I'm going to go ahead and compare the two files uh, that, are, that are in that directory, right? The moles run and the no moles run. So moles run, no moles run. Uh, obviously they're different. And I mean, they take exactly the same number of cycles. And what's even more surprising about it is the you know, it's saying throughput port, uh, throughput bottleneck is port one, and port one is the multiply port. So you would think uh, us removing a bunch of multiplies uh, would actually have helped things out, but I guess in reality the compiler was removing them or something, I don't really know. Uh, and so, you know, somehow that was not the case. So looking through here, I wish this counted, it's not actually counting the total number of multiplies. Uh, which is unfortunate. I don't know if there's a way uh, to do it. And you can even see the total number of micro ops is 349 um, in the original case. Uh, and uh, and uh, 306. So we actually got rid of 43 instructions. But getting rid of 43 instructions did not change the total block throughput in any way. It's exactly the same, basically, right? Um, and so let's take a look. So here's the block here. You've got two moles uh, in the red block, two moles in the, in the, um, the nominator block. Uh, this one, we actually have two moles at the head end, but only one mole here, although here's the other mole, presumably. Uh, so we've got two and two. There we go. No moles in anybody. Nobody's doing any moles for a while here. That's probably fetching those textures and so on, or something like this. Uh, come down here, uh, we get to uh, no moles in here, although we got P and, so these guys are creating a little bit of pressure here uh, on that port, right? Um, but still no moles, still no moles. Nobody is multiplying, apparently. Um, so here's mole PS, here's the mole PS here. So we're doing two there, we're doing one, then three, then here's the other two. It's, it's, it's really looking eerily like it's doing exactly the same number of multiplies, doesn't it? I mean, it's doing them in a different way, but man, um, it just looks like it's doing almost the exact same number of these guys. That's crazy. So somehow the compiler was actually, and we'd have to go through to do the forensics, but the compiler was actually smart enough to do that transformation or something close to it itself. Right? I mean, it was actually figuring out how to collapse all of that stuff that we were too dumb to do. So basically, all of that strength reduction and all of those term cancellations, uh, well, strength reduction is not the right word. All of those uh, sort of those cancellations, it found. As far as I can tell, it did that. Which is kind of awesome. Um, I guess that's the kind of thing that compiler or tree analysis is probably not that bad at doing, like looking for sort of ways you can restructure things and collapse constants, but still, a little bit surprising, right? I mean, you know, I often don't think of the compiler as really excelling at a lot of these things. Um, so I'm I'm reasonably impressed by that. I, I give the I give the compiler people some props on that. Um, you know, that's that's a lot better than I would have expected uh, the compiler to be doing uh, in that circumstance. That's just my opinion. Feel free to disagree, uh, but that's just my opinion. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of crazy, um, but I guess that's just how it goes. So let's keep looking at this. <laughs> and now we feel like we should at least try to beat the compiler, right? It feels kind of stupid at this point if we can't. 
uh, but oh well, right? Uh, so let's see here. Okay, uh, so if we run this guy, uh, we still haven't really made any demonstrative improvement there, and we kind of now know why. It doesn't really matter which one of those we do. The compiler was kind of outsmarting us. Um, so the question here, let's see, is what else can we do? So if we're doing these in 0 to 255 space, uh, one thing we could do is square them before we convert, right? Uh, that would certainly be an option. Uh, let's see how we're actually, so we're masking these guys out here. Uh, let me think about this for a second. So this would be actually fairly complicated if we wanted to do it, uh, but it is something that we could do, right? And it would take pressure off port one potentially because actually it would involve doing integer multiplies. So let's take a look. Uh, let's talk about this for a second and take a look uh, at what would be involved in doing this. I think it's probably uh, too much of a change to do just here at the end of the stream, uh, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? Let's take a look at the Intel Intrinsics Guide. I want to know about MMOL EPI32 on the Halem. So same throughput on uh, the, the EPI32 mol, which is the integer multiply, right? Uh, instead of, uh, you know, in, instead of, uh, oh, wait, that's the wrong one, sorry. I actually want EPI16, I suppose, huh? Mol EPI, oh, we don't have an EPI32. We don't, is it only, we, multiply the low 32 bit shares from each packed 64 bit element in A and B and store the sign to, uh, all right, well, well, I guess that's kind of dead in the water, unless I'm missing something, because if mm mull, uh, oh, duh. Right, I forgot. They're split up into mole low and mole high. Never mind. I was gonna say that'd be very, very strange. All right, I was like, I could have sworn I'd done this before. That's just how it goes in the stream sometimes. All right, so basically what we've got here, you know, we've got um, multiplies, the throughput on them is, is one, which is, I believe, comparable uh, to what we were seeing before, right? Latency five, throughput one, latency three, throughput one. So the latency is actually a little bit better. Uh, and the throughput's the same. So we could, if we want to, right, um, take a look at what we're doing here and try to do more of this wide, uh, wider than we were. Because when we converted to float, right, like right here, we converted to float, that meant from there on we could only be four wide. And technically some of these operations, right, we could be doing uh, in 16-bit integer. We mentioned that on a previous stream on staying at that, uh, on, on converting it to do uh, in that width. We could choose to do that um, if it turns out that some of these operations could be done quickly in that space and we wouldn't have to worry because since we're already now allowing it to be in the zero to 66, uh, um, 65025 space instead of zero to one, we wouldn't have to keep multiplying by a fix up, which is what really kills uh, fixed point operations. So we could, um, we could in theory do that. And looking through here, um, I feel like we could certainly do the square. And then I feel like we could do the square and then convert here, right? And that could, you know, that seems reasonable. And similarly at the end, I feel like we could in theory, well, we're not gonna be able to probably do a square root in fixed point, right? Like that's not probably gonna happen. So I feel like probably, yeah, I mean probably um, we just have to, we, you know, we just have to leave that the way it is. Although maybe, I don't know, maybe there's something else we could do there. I, I, I don't think so though. So, all right, so let's just take a quick look at what, would, what it would take to do that, right? Right now what's happening is we're doing these uh, shifts and masks uh, to put these things into their proper places. Uh, and so, you know, I guess what I would say is could we just, uh, instead of masking everything out, 
just mask out uh, two things at once, right? This is, this is, I guess, what I would think, you know, just, just off the top of my head about how to do this, right? So we've got a situation uh, where we've got our values and, you know, they look like this, right? This is what we've got coming in. You know, and if this is what we've got coming in, then I wonder if perhaps what we could do is instead um, of doing each one individually, what if we just knocked out the A and the G, uh, and right like so, and left like the R and the B in there, okay? Then these guys would be lined up exactly on the 16-bit lanes, so in theory we could just multiply them in by six, you know, 16, we could square them right in place, right? Then we go ahead and up convert those uh, to float um, by doing the, the additional mask, right? Uh, or doing an unpack with zero, doing something like that. Uh, that seems kind of compelling. So let's see if we can do that. I'll just do it for one of our texture, texture samples. So I'm going to need something other than mask FF. I'm going to need something that's like, you know, that. It's going to it's going to mask out uh, both the 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 bottom eight and the and then the eight that's 16 up from there, right? Uh, so I want to do that, uh, and we're going to call that. Uh, oop, I probably don't want to get rid of the actual mask FF just yet though, because we're still using that for the other guys. So I'm going to make this called mask foof. Mask foof sounds good to me. Uh, so we'll go in here and we, we'll do it twice, right? We'll do a mask foof here and we'll do a mask foof here. Uh, and so all we need to do is do a mask foof of, of, uh, of these guys. And instead of that being Texel A, B and, I uh, sorry, Texel uh, B and Texel G there, uh, this is actually going to be Texel R, B and Texel A, G, right? Um, so we're getting both of them, okay? Uh, so we're going to do that. And I don't actually want to do this part yet. I don't want to do the convert. I, I want to just leave them uh, the way that they are, right? I want to just leave them um, in place. And then what I want to do is I want to square them. So what I need to do is I need to produce an, a squared version of this guy and a squared version of, of this guy, which means I need to do an mm uh, mull of the 16-bit uh, values. But we now have to talk about what the difference is uh, between mull low and mull high. Okay, so this is going to be a square like so. I don't know, maybe there's a smarter way to do the square as well, but I'm just thinking it through at the moment. So what happens here is if you imagine having 16-bit values, right? So I've got 16 bits, and I'm going to multiply it by another 16 bits. Technically, the result for that is actually 32 bits, right? Because you're going to, you know, it's kind of like if you multiply 10 by 10, right? The result, oops, the result doesn't fit in, te in, in two things, right? It overflows to a higher uh, number of, of, of digits, right? So if we're multiplying two 16-bit values by each other, we're technically going to get a 32-bit result, but the result, since this is operating in 16-bit lanes, the result has to fit in 16 bits. So the multiply unit allows us to pick which of the resulting 16-bit lanes we actually want, right? Um, now, fortunately for us, we don't have to care about that too much because we're only actually using the bottom eight bits. So when we multiply the bottom eight by the bottom eight, we're only gonna get a 16-bit result. So the high portion, the overflow that would have flowed into the, the rest of it, we don't actually care about that. So we can just use mul low, which is the thing that, takes, that produces the low 16 bits of the multiplied result. And we don't have to care about mul high at all. We don't have to care about that, really. I don't think there's any reason we need to worry about that. So we can just do that. And that will square our values for us, right? Uh, so that means we can get rid of this here. So uh, and these, by the way, are M128Is. Uh, and so then when we come down here to produce uh, these M128s, of course, I just realized we do have one problem, which is that this would square our alpha as well. Hmm. That's kind of annoying. 
That's kind of annoying. Hmm. That introduces a wrinkle, because that means we can't quite get a perfect half reduction there. You know, I, it would be nice if we could, uh, but I don't think we can. So, hmm, that's, that's less cool. So we'd have to blow another instruction to or two of our alphas together in order to save the square, which doesn't sound necessarily like such a great idea. I don't know, uh, but it does mean for the time being uh, that we would just need to look at that, leave that the way it is. So we'll think about that. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I guess, I guess we don't have to go that far, right? I mean, we could just knock out the multiplier, right? I mean, we could do something where we've got the alpha, you know, we could do this, right? Uh, we could and with mask FF, and that would knock out uh, that alpha in, in, in the multiply, which would leave the alpha unsquared. But again, you know, it, it sucks because we, we, I thought we were going to get a bigger reduction there than we were, but we're, we're having to introduce like that additional uh, operation, which is, which is too bad. But all right, um, you know, uh, that's, that's just the way it is. So once we've got that, you know, now we should be able to, in theory, uh, uh, go ahead and, and loft these up into uh, the actual, uh, sorry, we could convert these up from, uh, from uh, fixed point there to floating point, right, from zero, from the uh, integers to floats. Uh, and that's what this will do, but now we have a problem, which is we actually have uh, R and B mixed together, right, and A and G mixed together, okay? Um, so what we need to do is we need to introduce the conversions uh, in a way that will actually um, uh, uh, that will actually grab out the ones we, we, we want, right? Uh, and so I think uh, probably the most efficient way to do that is still just with masking, um, I would think. I don't know, that's a pipeline. There's other ways we could do it, an unpack might do it. So we might have to look and see which of the you know which of them would be the most overlappable of the things we have but the <clears throat> just looking at these values you know if we if we went on and introduced uh, another and here uh, where we just and with uh, with that mask ff that would give us just the i guess that would give us just the b channel right that would knock out the a i'm sorry that would knock out the r uh, and then to get uh, if we did the, the shift to the right uh, to bring the, the R value down, that would just be that, that shift down by 16, right? So we could do that to grab out that R value. Uh, similarly for the G value, uh, that's already in uh, that correct position. So that would again also just be another mask. Let's see, of, of Texel uh, AAG. And then finally, the, the end uh, here would just be uh, grabbing out uh, that alpha value uh, from, from the AG. So I think I did that right. Kind of confusing mentally to think about. Um, but let's see if that looks right at all. All right, I'm going to go ahead and say that that's probably incorrect. Now, I'm just, I just have a hunch looking at it. I just have a hunch that that is probably not correct. So let's go ahead, it's Q&A, um, but let's go ahead and just try to, uh, try to take a quick look and see what I did wrong there. All right, so we've got our Texel ARRB and our Texel uh, AG here. The way I get them is by doing the shift and masking uh, out values, right? So that puts everyone in the 16-bit lanes, or at least I think it does. Uh, that's what I'm arguing that it does. Uh, and, and so I hope that's the case uh, because, yeah, that, that seems pretty straightforward. We could check it in the debugger. Uh, we're then going to do a multiplication uh, of, of it with itself, which will just do that multiply. And, and I'm arguing that would basically give us 8 bit times 8 bit. So it's giving us that 16 bit value that we wanted, the multiplication value that we wanted. Uh, and in this case, with the Texel AAG, I had to do an additional mask here to mask out so that the multiply would only multiply just the green value. So I masked out uh, that alpha value 
uh, from one side of the term, so it would only multiply the g, right? Um, so I did that. I then tried to produce the texel values from them by shifting the rb value down 16 in each of the 32-bit the wide lanes, which I felt like should give me just the r sitting in the bottom. Uh, and of course, since it's shifting in zeros, it should just clear, it should just be clear with just the r sitting there. Uh, the g is already in the bottom, so I just had to take the aag and mask out uh, that, um, mask out uh, the, the alpha. The rb value right already had the b sitting in the bottom, so all I had to do is mask that out. And then the aag, uh, again, I can just shift that down by 16 to get um, the alpha out of the aag. So I feel like that should have been correct. You can then convert those directly to float, and I felt like that should have done it. But, um, you know, as we can see, uh, it definitely didn't do it, right? Uh, that is a good example of what we might call not doing it. Um, what's sort of clear, I think about, well, you know what? I'm not sure I can read very much out of that. I, that's a little confusing. Um, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Um, but uh, yeah, let's go ahead and, and just uh, step through it in the debugger and see what happens. All right, so I wanna stuff something in here that I can actually perceive, right? I wanna stuff something in here that I can see. Uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take sample A and I'm gonna do an uh, uh, mm set uh, epi32 on that guy. So I can actually set the values of this guy. There, I assume there is a set epi32, yeah. Uh, so what I'm gonna do there is I'm gonna set uh, the values of it to, to look like kind of those values that we were talking about before, right? Uh, so I can see them a little bit better. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna set it so that the red channel, um, I'm sorry, the blue channel is ff so I can see where it goes, right? Um, and what happens to it, okay? So let's see, uh, and, and I guess what I'll do here is I'll, you know what else I'll do? I'll set these um, to something that uh, I'll be able to recognize uh, maybe easy, more easily uh, when they get uh, squared. So let's see, that'll be squared to two, then we'll do that and that, right? Um, yeah, that seems reasonable. Uh, oh, and this obviously goes there. Okay, so let's see. Uh, let's see what that's doing. Here we come into sample A. Uh, and if uh, I take a look, I want to look at the, uh, the I-16 uh, probably of it, uh, since that's the sort of what we're what we're working with at this point. Uh, well, it's actually U16, I guess, is what we're working with, right? And so if I take a look at it, uh, you can see that I sort of stuffed uh, some things in here rather specifically. Um, uh, so, well, I don't really love the order this is showing it to me in, but that's okay. So this is still, Roughly what I would have expected, zero, two, yeah, okay. So now let's take a look at Texel ARB. So after it does that masking, um, what are the actual values here, right? Um, and so after doing the masking, which is designed to remove uh, the middle values, we have nothing in there, so we should just see the exact same stuff that we have here, which is which is good. Uh, let's see, Texel AAG. Now this one should have nothing in it but zeros because this one is supposed to shift and mask out, so we should have all zeros, which we do. Uh, we're then going to do the squaring into Texel ARB, right? So these numbers should all square. Um, they do. Uh, oops, but that one is. Oh, but that's fine, right? We're supposed to square out in, out of the 255 range. That's that's what's supposed to happen. That's fine. 
Uh, and so now we have those values uh, multiplied low and sitting in there waiting to be up converted. Okay. Um, so here are the values, right? Uh, and that is what we would expect them to be, right? Uh, so let's see when we actually go to do our, our up conversion, texel uh, AR, which is the only thing that should have uh, anything in it, I believe. Uh, let's see what it actually, what it actually is. Uh, M120, oh, oops, MM, uh, what's the actual mnemonic for that? It's M128F32, okay. All right, so we do it and we get all zeros for the red channel. Oh, that's okay, it was the blue channel, sorry, that we were doing. So that's actually correct. Uh, the green channel, the blue channel. So green channel should have nothing, it does, and the blue channel should have those values in it. Uh, and there is obviously my mistake. Ah, uh, yes. Well, that would do it. That would do it, folks. So, you know, you got to think it all the way through. You don't get any points for just thinking part of the way through. If I mask out just the eight bits, well, that's not going to do us very much good if these are 16-bit values. So we got to mask out 16s, not eights, right? Um, kind of a no-brainer there, uh, but what are you going to do? Okay, let's try that again, shall we? Um, oh, of course, I got to take out my MM set uh, PS there if I want to see uh, what it's actually looking like. Uh, so there we go. All right, not feeling great about that either, but it's better, oddly enough. Um, it's actually partially correct, uh, which doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. To be completely honest with you. Um, so that's a bit odd, uh, but uh, you know, what are you gonna do? Um, oh, duh, I forgot to change both our masks. That's probably the only problem. Um, oops, spoke a little too soon. Not quite just the only problem. Um, oh, changed it in the wrong place. Oh no, so I did, I did change it in both places. I, t I take it back. I, I'm not. I'm not totally out to lunch. It's totally fine. So that's. Uh, I think all fine. That makes reasonable sense. Ah. But forgot one more thing. I can't just mask this out, right? Because I need the mul. It's a multiply, right? It would need to be ones there. Hmm, so yeah, I mean, I would ne I need to basically make sure that the alpha comes through. Um, so that's the la that's, yeah. I mean, I can do it, but again, it just costs more instructions. I, there, I wonder, is there some clever way uh, that I can make this work so that the alpha comes through, you know, unsquared? which is what I want um, to, to have happen, right? I want that alpha to remain uh, unsquared the entire time uh, because the alpha never gets square rooted at the end and, and we want it linear, right? Um, that's the only thing we need as a trick. We need a, a simple way uh, to make this vector not have the alpha be squared. Well, actually, do we need to do that? I guess now that I think about it, is that just stupid? Could we just square them both, right? But, but actually pull out the alpha ahead of time. How hard would that be, right? Not very. Um, so am I just making a mountain out of a molehill? there right am i just was that just just a, a lot of ado about nothing and it turns out 
uh, that it was. All right, so that's pretty good. That's a pretty good thing. And now we can do that. Now we can actually do uh, those wide. Uh, so let's take a look and see how that's doing there. That totally runs just fine. Still nice and zippy. Um, and so let's take a look at what happens if we just go ahead and, you know, and convert them all, right? Uh, so let's see. If I was to convert them all, right, we'd just have, that would be Texel A replaced with Texel B, yeah? Then we do Texel uh, B replaced with Texel C, and then we do Texel C replaced with Texel D. Probably should make a macro for these, huh? Uh, and that would be that. Uh, and then when we do the conversions, again, it would just be the same here for everybody. So Texel A um, becomes Texel B, Texel B becomes Texel C, and Texel C becomes Texel D. Right? Off we go. And hey, that definitely did make a difference, right? Um, although I feel like I introduced a bug there. It doesn't look, I feel like it's not quite bilinearing like it's supposed to. Um, I could be wrong about that. I want, want to make sure, let's make sure I didn't do something stupid there. We probably should have some kind of compliance test at this point, uh, since we're doing so many wacky things with the rendering. Spot checking by eye is not exactly uh, the best thing to do there. Uh, but what, uh, what, did I do anything totally dumb there? Uh, we're doing the mole low. Uh, ah, we're reading from only sample A. That's the problem. So there we go. Just got to read. We're only reading from one, one sample. So there we go. Back to our proper bilinear. Uh, it does look like, though, we're getting still a little bit of oddity. Like if you look at our hero, he's got some green fringing. It looks like he just, it looks like the alpha is just not quite right. It looks like it's, uh, I feel like uh, we're still a little bit buggy there. Um, and so that's also, we're kind of eating up most of the Q&A here. Sorry about that. Um, but you know, what are you going to do? Um, so I feel like, oh, there we go. Still got one more. Just as I'm saying we need to make a macro for something, there's cut and paste bug. I think that's pretty good evidence for it. Uh, so there we go. All right. Uh, and so that, let's see how that goes when we run it. So that is actually way worse than we were doing before, right? That's actually super. So the only reason we got that phantom speed up there was because I had had the, the typo there. So that's actually way worse than we were before uh, doing those operations uh, in the, doing those operations like so. So I wonder if we run that through the little analyzer, I wonder why, right? So if I do this and do our compile there and then go back to our little capture here, um, this is 16 bit square, right? Uh, let's take a look at what it outputs, right? So 16 bit square is way worse on the cycles, right? Uh, and it says the throughput bottleneck is inter iteration. I don't even know what that means. That would definitely be a question. Uh, for Fabian, certainly not for me. Um, but the total number of micro ops is much smaller than it was before, right? Um, much, much smaller. So, because if you remember, if you look back at uh, our previous uh, run here, the no moles run, if you look back, it was 306 and now it's 283, right? Uh, and the moles run, furthermore, right, uh, whatever it was, what was it called, moles run dot out. The moles run was more still. So we went from 350 uh, down to 283 actual operations. But because of which operations they were, it's actually worse for us uh, 
in terms of the total block throughput, right? Uh, which sucks. Can't catch a break, you know what I'm saying? So, I don't know. I don't know if that sometimes, I feel like that's probably a good place to end because sometimes that means you should backtrack. Other times, uh, that means you should push forward and try to find a better way to do whatever it is that you were doing. So I'm not 100% sure which one of these we should do. And so it might be good to just let it sit for a little bit uh, and think about what we want to pursue uh, going forward, right? Um, just something to think about. Now, loading the destination, we could do exactly the same thing, right? So, hmm. I mean, loading the destination, we could do the exact same stuff for, but if that made us slower, I'm not sure that this is gonna make us faster by converting that. In theory, you would want some things in the, in the floating point pipe while other things were in the, in, in the integer pipe anyway and stuff like that. So I don't really know, this is kind of tough. I feel like kind of staring at this disassembly uh, and coming to some conclusions about what needed to happen uh, to take the uh, pressure off in the places where it's currently bottlenecking, either in the, uh, on the pure floating point version or here in the wide version, uh, would be required before taking any next steps that so don't have an immediate idea of what we would do uh, to do better. We could change this to be wide, but you know, what it wouldn't actually uh, help. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't, I don't think that would actually help. All right, well, I'm gonna do the Q and A because we should have some Q and A. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and, and do that. Uh, and we will, you know, maybe come back and, and revisit uh, this. this. This may not be the end of it because we may want to take a, another look at these uh, as we go. So, okay. Oh, CP stands for critical path. Okay. Thanks, guys. I'm assuming people can read the manual for this as well. So in theory, you guys on the stream should probably or probably already know a bunch more about this tool than I do. Um, but so yeah, so critical path, I guess, is is bad. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so we don't want to be seeing a lot of CP. Uh, but yeah. All right, let's take a look here. ICA was showing port one as the bottleneck, not port zero. Ah, typical programmer, uh, non-programmer mistake I made there. So if port one was the bottleneck, then yeah, reducing pressure on the multiplies wouldn't help at all. Um, but wait, so here's the part that was confusing me. Why does the 1.0 go in, that, in the zero column for the mul PS? That's why I was reading it that way. Um, so I don't know, what are you talking, how did you know that the mul PS was in the one? I don't think that's true. I feel like the mul PS is in the zero. Are you sure, Flaturated? I don't think that's true. Interiteration means that run, that run X of a loop depends on the X minus one run. Well, why would that be true? Because these loops are independent. You could run them totally separately if you wanted to. They shouldn't be dependent in any way, actually. So are you sure about that? You 
should try pulling out the texture pointer dereferencing from the inner loop to local variables. The compiler is probably doing a read every time because of aliasing. Uh, doing a read every time of what exactly? Um, Oh, are you talking about like texture, arrow, pitch, and so on? Uh, yes, I could totally pull those out. Because uh, like texture pointer obviously is, is, is going to be different. Yes, I can certainly hoist those if you think that's uh, something where the compiler thinks there's aliasing and doesn't want to do it. Uh, so the texture pitch I can put out here, right? Texture pitch. Um, <clears throat> Let's see, uh, texture pitch, looks like just texture pitch, texture memory is it, right? Those are the only things that are used. I don't see anything else. Um, <clears throat> wow, so that was a pretty good call as well, because um, this is the, the routine that was actually slow, right? This was actually the routine that was much slower, because uh, we're still using the old version there. Uh, so let's, let's, let me take a quick look at that. Uh, uh, texture locals. Go. Yeah, that's that definitely did make an improvement. So you were correct. The compiler did not know that it could uh, save those because since they were accessing off a pointer, uh, it thought, I guess, uh, that um, it thought that maybe they could change. So it had to read them every time, and that helped it out quite a bit. Uh, possibly because it can do, um, you know, optimizations with them now, and possibly just because it doesn't have to do the read, which, you know, maybe that was a problem. That read would have always been in the cache, so I doubt it, but I guess it would just at least help uh, the compiler in terms of all the other optimizations to know, right, that that's not what's actually happening um, there. So yeah, that was pretty cool. Very good idea. I guess um, so. I guess the question now. Let me take a look at that runs with texture locals here. Um, Two hundred and seventy nine micro ops, and so the previous sixteen bit one. So we we reduced the number of operations down just a little bit as well. Uh, block throughput though still the same. So that was purely just memory stuff that was causing that. It's a little weird. I'm not sure I have full faith in what this is telling me, but all right. So yeah. Let's check that here. How does one support new instructions which are not yet ubiquitous, like AVX? Do you just check CPU bits and set up function pointers to appropriate implementations? Yes, that is exactly what you do. What about register saving for things like context switches? Would one have to worry about such things with the SIMD registers? Uh, no, because in general, well, actually, I guess that's not true. I don't actually know, because I've never tried it, what happens on AVX on older operating systems if they're smart enough to mask it from you or whether you still see the AVX as being there and then if you use it, you would just get uh, totally hosed because they're not saved. So I actually don't know. You may have to check for a combination of operating system and CPU ID. I'm not sure. So you would have to, at the very least, go double check. 
that. Um, so I, I'm not sure, I'm sorry. You have to at least check uh, to see and then set the function pointers, but I'm just, I'm just not sure. How about trying to replace squirt with mull r squirt? Uh, yeah, we could definitely replace squirt with mull r squirt. We're still using the slower throughput version here though, so I'm, I'm a little hesitant to try any of these things, but we can do that. Um, what he's basically saying is instead of issuing the actual square root, uh, you know, we could instead of doing that um, use there's a faster reciprocal square root, which gives you an approximated one over the square root. Um, it's it's this right, um, and so you know uh, the idea w is uh, is basically to to use the reciprocal square root instead of the square root uh, command and so uh, square, square root operation. So I don't actually know what r squared throughput is, but I think it's very high. Uh, right, it's throughput one or two on this processor. Uh, and so if you take a look at, um, at the squirt PS that we were using, uh, right, the throughput is much slower, right? Uh, it's only 16. So yeah, so basically the idea here would be um, we have a number, we have x, uh, and we know that we want to compute the square root of x, but the only thing we actually can compute is 1 over uh, the square root of x, right? Um, at least, is that what we want to compute? What are we computing in total here? We're just taking blended. We're taking blend. No, that yeah. So that's that's what we want. So we have one over the square root of x, and what we want to do um, is we want to uh, we want to invert that, right? Um, so yeah, if we take that and multiply it. Uh, so if we take that, we've got, uh, you know, y, whatever, whatever it's gonna do, it's gonna give us y equals, you know, one over, uh, one over x. We need to be able to do something to that uh, that will produce uh, just square root of x for us. So if we do multiply both sides, right, multiply both sides by x, we would get x over the square root of x, right? Um, and of course we know uh, that x equals, uh, we could replace this x, right, with square root of x times square root of x, because the square root of x times square root of x, or, you know, square root of x squared, right, is x. Uh, so that would cancel the square root and just leave us with one square root x. So x times the value that we get back from that uh, should give us the value that we actually want, right? So mm mol ps uh, blended r times uh, reciprocal square root, right? Oops, modifying the wrong one here. Uh, mol ps mol ps uh, and so on. And there we go. Uh, so, getting those out of there also does look like a good thing. Let's take a look at the no square root version. But again, uh, since we don't, we're kind of in flux a little bit here, uh, it's hard to tell sometimes because, uh, you know, we don't actually know. Uh, we're still using that wide uh, squaring, which, which didn't help us, right? Uh, no squirt, or we just call this r squirt. Uh, so let's go ahead and take a look at what that gives us. Temp r squared. Uh, so that uh, did also, wait, did that actually, should have gone up. Yeah, so that added a few uh, cycles, added a few instructions because of the r squared, um, but it did reduce the total uh, throughput down from what it was previously, so that is good. Uh, definitely good but so I don't know so maybe we should actually not do the wide thing or maybe we should try doing the wide thing further or maybe what we need to do is just do these in a slightly different way so that they would 
be able to assign better out here. Uh, and to be honest, I again, since it's the first time I've ever used this thing, I don't have a really good feel uh, for the right way to interpret uh, what I'm seeing, right? It's not a tool I have experience with. So on stream, when I'm trying to talk and do a lot of stuff, I, I can't, you know, I would have to be an expert on this to be able to do anything real with it in the middle of the stream. So I suspect, I mean, looking at this with all of these, uh, looking at this through here, and you can see that so many things are going into port one there. <coughs> um, yeah. So, oh, Fabian's actually watching. See, what we really need is him to just be in the chair. That would help things out a lot. But unfortunately, we haven't quite gotten that happening yet. Um, but yeah, he's just commenting on the thing before, which is multiplier in port 0, add in port 1. Um, it looks like also... So, things that happen in, in port 1, right? We've got... The adds and the comps both happen in that port, uh, and it doesn't look like they can ever happen on any other port, right? Um, so the adds, the maxes, the mins, all that stuff uh, kind of stuffs up in that port, which, and the sub, yeah. So the multiplies that are actually doing um, the uh, the 16-bit multiplies, um, I assume that those also went into port one, so that was, yeah, pretty much all bad. So I guess, I feel like that just sort of suggests that we don't want to try and do this, why? Because it just adds to all of that uh, port one pressure, and if we did do the multiplies and floating point, it's kind of like they're free because they're going into port zero where we didn't have the pressure, in theory. Um, but I guess, you know, on top of that, I also, I don't know how to balance the fact that you can do more of them at once, right? So it is true that you can, you know, if this were cleverer, perhaps, you know, it is doing, able to do more of the multiplies with one uh, actual issue of a multiply. So it's, it's you know, I don't necessarily know how to balance that out. Uh, so I'm just, I'm just not sure about that. So I probably, I think I just want to let this sit for a bit. Uh, we'll come back to it tomorrow since this is kind of interesting and I get to learn about how to use this thing and how to read it, which uh, is yet yeah, again, like on stream, it's kind of be hard to be hit with a new thing. And it's hard, I apologize for not knowing all the stuff I should uh, am looking at, because it's going to take me a little while to come up to speed on it. But it looks pretty cool. Uh, and yeah. I mean, it looks like for the most part, that would kind of indicate that because of that port pressure, going wide would actually be very, going wider would actually be very hard for us uh, to do. Because since we're already using that unit, even in the floating point path to do the mins and maxes, we'd have to come up with like some other creative way not to do that. So yeah. How can removing the square root help performance if the square root is done on the multiply port, not the adder port? Um, <clears throat> so I guess the thing that I would say about it was that normally that would be the right way to think about it, but I suspect in this case it's not simply because it's so, the throughput's so long, right? It's 16 cycle throughput, which means that it's like, even if we were perfectly pipelined, we have to do three square roots, 
which means three times 16 cycles just to get those square roots done. So that amount of overhang is pretty hard to fill with stuff, especially because it comes at the end of the loop. So you're basically talking about going up into the next loop probably to grab more stuff to do, right? Is the only place it's gonna come from. Uh, so I feel like it probably has something to do with the fact that the total distance between the last square root and, you know, and when it would have to issue a mole PS before it could do anything else just isn't wide enough to be three times 16 cycles long, right? It just isn't far enough. So even though it's not on a high pressure port, um, that it's so big, its footprint is so big, I suspect the processor just can't deal with having the port gone for that long. It can't, it can't move all the other mulls, it, it, you know, I mean, keep in mind, there's dependencies through this whole code. The processor can't just uh, execute any instruction it wants whenever it wants. It still has to execute dependent or, uh, instructions in series. So I suspect that that probably has a lot to do with it, but I don't know. That'd be my suspicion. All right. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. This has been very interesting for me uh, because I never have seen this tool before. It's cool. I'm going to have to learn this and I'm going to probably run this on my own code now because I did not know it was available. Uh, it's pretty great. So thank you Fabian for that and for your optimization help in general. Uh, I think that uh, people are probably getting a much uh, better <clears throat> view of optimization in general already and I think that will obviously go uh, double uh, when you put up a stream or come on this stream, one or the other, which I hope we can make happen. Uh, because, yeah, I mean, basically, like I said before, if you have an expert on something, um, they're going to know a lot of stuff that, that you don't know. And, you know, one of the things that's really nice about having been in the game industry a long time is that you know people who you can ask when you know you don't know stuff, right? And optimization is one of those things that definitely, and especially on SSE2, I just haven't done very much of. And so um, <clears throat> all of the things that you should know if you really do it on a day-to-day -day basis and want to be very good at it are not things that I can uh, teach. So again, thank you very much for that. And uh, I think everyone on the stream really appreciates uh, you taking the time to give us the pointers because otherwise, you know, <laughs> we would have done just the translation of the routine and that probably would have been it, right? So that's pretty awesome, and, uh, and uh, we will come back to it tomorrow and maybe just try to think about a little bit what our strategy is here. Um, is there anything interesting that we could do, uh, or should we just go ahead and move it back to doing it in float and say that that's the way it should probably work? So that's what we'll do tomorrow. Uh, as always, if, uh, if you would like to follow along at home uh, with Handmade Hero, you can do so by uh, going to the Handmade Hero website and you can pre-order the, uh, pre the game and it comes with the source code. So if you want to follow along with what we're doing and play around with the optimization yourself um, and maybe find some faster ways to do the things that we're doing now that you've seen how to do it, um, anyone can read that diagram and in fact probably better than I can because it's the first time I've ever seen it. I will be going to read the, the, you know, the docs on it for sure. Um, so, you know, you could play around with it. You could take a look and see if you can figure out different ways to structure the same stuff that we're doing so that it uh, ends up um, filling those ports better, getting rid of some of those stalls, doing whatever needs to happen. Uh, because I believe, unless I'm very much in error, those printouts that we're seeing there are showing us what our maximum block throughput would be if there were no memory stalls. And so in some sense, we're kind of for free getting a pretty, presumably pretty good estimate of what the code speed actually is when you discount um, anything that has to do with memory, which is kind of nice because it means we can sort of play around a little with the how fast the routine is capable of going intrinsically, pun intended, uh, before actually looking at the memory part of it, um, which kind of might help us get through it because then we can kind of break those into pieces and, and you know work on them separately until they converge, right? So that's kind of cool too, which is harder to do if you don't have a tool uh, that can tell you what that throughput would be separate from the memory. All right, so anyway, uh, thank you very much for joining me for another episode of Handmade Hero. 
As always, check out HandmadeHero.org if you need anything, if you want to pre-order the game, if you want to go to the forums and ask questions or get ports to Mac or Linux or see the annotated episode guide, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, if you want to subscribe to the Patreon page and support the video series, we would very much love it if you did that. And there's also the Tweetbot, which has a schedule. So if you want to catch the live stream, that is what uh, it will be. Uh, and uh, and uh, it also has a schedule posted on the weekend for the whole week. So hopefully you can always catch us live if you want to see us live. And until the next time that you do, thanks so much for tuning in. We will be off tomorrow, actually, now that I think about it. It's Saturday will be the next stream. So definitely check the Tweetbot if you want to catch that. I think it's Saturday at 8 p.m. All right. Thanks, everyone, and I will catch you later.